Professor Johnson, Professor Dawson, and a lot of people. Uh, at the time, I didn't know these are all big people, and then I was just uh, having fun. And uh, then suddenly, one uh, thin professor comes with a green sweater, and Professor Vesas takes me, uh, drags me by hand, and then takes me to him and says, This is Professor Greenwood, and he introduced uh, me. This is Bob G, who is going to work on uh, uh, surface roughness. At uh, that time, I didn't know anything about uh, Greenwood. Uh, Greenwood was the guy who started uh, uh, this effect of surface roughness, measuring and uh, characterizing surface roughness uh, from a tribological viewpoint. And he, ha he, was, he had published a lot of paper uh, and then. So Greenwood was excited uh, that I'm going to work on surface roughness. Uh, and then uh, he took me aside. He, he took me away from Professor Biswas. And then uh, he started talking. And you know, those days, uh, the accent was a problem. Whatever they speak uh, in English, uh, it's very difficult to understand. And whatever I speak, uh, it's not coherent. It has to be very slow. The communication was uh, very tough. Uh, but finally, at the end of the day, he said that I will get you a book. I think you are not understanding what I'm trying to tell. I will get you a book. I will borrow you. I will lend you a book. And then uh, by the end of the uh, week, when the workshop is ending, you have to return it. So next day morning, he remembered and he brought a book and then caught me and gave me this book. That book was on uh, fractals. So he says that uh, fractal is the way to go in surface roughness. Uh, whatever I have done is wrong. Okay, please read this book and then don't follow me. Start from this. Okay, that is the start of my journey in characterizing or understanding surface roughness. So he gave me this book. I finished that book in three days, three nights. You know, whole day we had workshop and evening we have dinner uh, with wine and things like that. After that, I have, before going to bed, I have to read that book because those days uh, uh, no photocopying is allowed. All this copyright violation, and everything will be there. So you have to finish the book and finish the book by uh, like in three days. I returned the book and then came back. I started working on uh, fractal. So that is the starting of my journey to the surface roughness. And that is why uh, Professor Biswas is very important uh, for uh, introducing me this subject to this area and a lot of people who have contributed. And uh, just, uh, I will take a sl slide. Mm. Yeah, so this is what the broad area with which I was working uh, with Professor Biswas, if you see, uh, we were interested in understanding how the size dependent material property is affecting uh, tribology. Uh, size dependent material property is, is the thing that as the material becomes smaller and smaller, deformation volume of the material increases, the materials become stronger and stronger uh, in most of the time uh, because number of defects in that uh, volume of uh, deformation is very less. It gets because deformation volume we are talking is smaller than the size of the this typical dislocation would loop. So there is no dislocation, for example, in metals or no cracks in uh, ceramics within that deformation volume. So the strength of the material, it's more or less very pure. It is not affected by the defects present in the material. So this uh, material property is high and material property is going to interact when you think about two surfaces coming in contact and rubbing against each other, it's just what tribology is. And that is what we are interested in. Uh, you see there are two things which we are uh, interfering. One is the geometry of the surfaces, another one is the material. Okay. So we needed to understand both these things. Uh, so we had divided this one. Uh, experimentally, we try to characterize the geometry. Experimentally, we try to uh, understand the small scale behavior using nano inundation. And to bring these together, uh, it was very difficult. So we developed models uh, on uh, rough surfaces. Inundation on rough surfaces is what uh, we did. So I started working on this one. You see this characterize the roughness. At the time, atomic force microscope was very new. And then we started using atomic first microscopes. And then I will talk a little bit about that. And then uh, we started using this power spectrum. And that's what uh, to, the left hand side is what today I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, if you don't understand any anything at any point of time, please stop me. If it is like uh, it's too hard, uh, please let me know. Uh, let uh, Ashok uh, interfere me. I will go back and then uh, try to get it back to the uh, basics, 
okay uh, i'm going to ask questions i want some answers uh, at least few of you if you can answer it will be helpful because we i am a guy uh, i'm a kind of guy where uh, all my talks are very interactive uh, so i want that to happen in the uh, online uh, talks as well uh it's very difficult it is turning out to be very difficult to have uh, as much interaction as uh, I, i will have in the in the physical presence but anyway we will try we will try to take uh, some uh, questions some interactions uh, should be possible uh so everybody kind of knows what is surface roughness everybody knows what is rough uh, we have always experienced uh, roughness uh, we know that uh, when we go on a journey in a car or a bus we always say uh, road is very rough now the journey was tough road was very rough uh, we know that what is roughness is uh, this shirt feels very rough that is very fine so don't buy this cloth buy that cloth okay silk sarees are uh, bought only by touching and feeling if you have ever bothered to go uh, uh, saree shopping with your uh, mother or uh, daughters or uh, girlfriends right <laughs> so uh, people try to feel the roughness uh, with uh, various means and this roughness exists from very many scales uh, roughness exists at geo technical uh, geo uh, geo scales at uh, earthquakes and then uh, are responsible because of the uh, two uh, a tectonic plates which are rough sliding past each other being held by some of the asperities and then as when the asperities yield give way uh, the one tectonic plate slides against the other and then you cause a uh, earthquake which crosses huge damage and similarly roughness is there uh, in a very small scale like we uh, in manufacturing we say that we want to pass the quality control we say this surface is too rough it's not uh, assembly will create problem so go and uh, smoothen it and we have also roughness uh, uh, try to smoothen the roughness in the ceiling uh, area when we have the ceiling radia we have to have a special pro uh, process a pure turning will not uh, prevent a o-ring uh, from leaking so we have to have a special process and only few uh, uh, practical uh, machinists will know they will take a uh, emery paper and then smoothen it out there uh, the o-ring surfaces so you have to tell them this is a ceiling surface otherwise they won't know that is the roughness has, has to be in a particular type uh, to prevent leakages okay so here there are two pictures so this is how we typically measure roughness more on this i will come and you see that this is uh, uh, two profiles roughness profiles what we call a uh, variation of height along a distance which is on the x axis okay uh, one of the picture i tell you uh, is is a fractured surface of a aluminum alloy other one is a fractured surface of a earth that is a uh, 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 roughness of uh, himalayas okay i'll tell you uh, okay specifically uh, this is the uh, mountain range as looked from uh, sikkim overlooking uh, kanyanjanga okay one of these peak is kanyanjanga now i am going to ask you which one is which which the top one is uh, kanyanjanga himalayas or uh, top one is aluminum uh, fractured aluminum surface i will pause here for a few few seconds and then uh, can you some of you type i i'm not able to see question and answer uh, box uh, sir i will help you sir that uh, if anybody ask question i, I can able to help. chart you got to click the chart sir so you can yeah. able to see uh, any because so, i'm sharing uh, it's not <laughs> allowing me to uh, do anything else no sir you can do sir anything so dear yeah. participant if you have any queries you please uh, uh, type uh, ping, ping us in a uh, chat box or you can uh, if you request i can uh, made you uh, you can speak directly to babji sir uh question and answer is empty chat can somebody tell me like which one is uh, mount uh, i mean kanjanjanga
Nobody wants to take a risk. <laughs> okay, Ashok, at least you tell. Sir? <laughs> Just choose one. Blindly. Kanjan Janga, sir. Which is Kanjan Janga? Mm. Uh, that last one. The second one. Bottom Sorry. one. Yeah. Uh, you want to take a uh, guess on why? Uh, because uh, this is the uh, see first graph we can able to see the valley is more. Second is uh. Uh, that peak uh, high. Okay. Uh, so if you ask, uh, this is the, there is a problem in this uh, way the data is presented. The problem is the x-axis and y-axis don't have the same scale. So what I'm going to do in the next picture, I'm going to draw it uh, to the same scale. And then you'll see uh, it becomes uh, much clearer. Okay. So now you see uh, the x-axis and y-axis have the same scale. Uh, the uh, distance is same. Uh, there, the previous uh, slide, uh, the vertical axis was magnified a lot compared to horizontal axis. Okay, this is a typical problem we face. So that is why whenever any instrument measures roughness, we, when the data comes out, you see that uh, surface looks very, very rough. But in practice, surface is like this. And Ashok Raj is uh, well-trained and he has listened to my talk many times. So he was right that the top one is the fractured aluminum surface, whereas the bottom one is the uh, Kanjanjanga. You see this, uh, the top rightmost is the Kanjanjanga. We have all uh, encountered this when we, uh, when as a kid, when we are asked to draw a mountain and a house and a river, we always drew one big, two, two big triangles to indicate a mountain, right? The kids always know uh, intuitively the mountains have highest peaks, whereas uh, rough surfaces, uh, we think rough, but they are, look very, very smooth. That is, as we go down in the scale, as we go down in the scale, as we keep on magnifying, the roughness keeps on decreasing. This is uh, something which is what uh, we need to understand. Uh, this is uh, the one thing which struck me uh, early because this is not told to you in tribology classes or any other roughness measurement classes. Okay, before uh, we get into this detail, uh, what is roughness? Roughness, as I said, is intuitively known by many people and many people measure roughness by, uh, by touching the surface or by making a nail uh, uh, rub against the surface. We always have done that. Uh, roughness is something which is not smooth. That's all we wanted to say, but somehow this uh, roughness is what uh, has stuck. It is what we want is smoothness. Many times we want smooth surfaces, not rough surfaces. Nobody likes uh, uh, rough floor, a rough road, or a rough person either. We want everything to be smooth. Smooth person is better than rough person, right? Right, uh, so what is roughness? Roughness is a deviation of solid surface, any solid surfaces from the intended geometrical form. So, so if you want to make a gear surface, we want uh, that particular shape, whether it's cycloidal or helicoidal, whatever uh, surface, any deviation from there, uh, we call that as uh, roughness. Okay. So uh, we have a road, we want it to be plain plain, flat, and things like that. Any deviation from the flatness, we, will, we call it uh, road is rough. Uh, if most of you are from Bangalore, if you have managed to go on a highway or in and around Bangalore, there is a stretch uh, from uh, Bangalore to Tumkur, closer to Tumkur, I think like 10, 15 kilometers close to Tumkur. The road is very, very smooth for 15 kilometers. You will love driving there. It, the car has no vibration, no noise, except the wind noise. If you close down the windows, uh, only engine noise uh, can be heard. The road goes, you yourself feel the roughness is so low of uh, this. But do we always want a smooth surface? It's not clear. We or sometimes we want uh, rough surfaces too. If you are climbing, uh, if you are a mountain climber, 
uh, you want the surfaces, uh, mountain surfaces to be very rough. You don't want to be a smooth granite surface because you cannot hold on to anything if you want to climb the mountain. So just like friction is sometimes good, sometimes bad, roughness is also sometimes good, sometimes bad. We sometimes purposefully increase the uh, roughness of the surface. And if I ask the question again, I'm not going to get any response. So I think I will not ask questions. Can you tell, imagine, please think about yourselves. Uh, where are the locations in which we want the surfaces purposefully roughened? Right? Uh, has anybody done a whitewashing of their house, painting their houses? They will know. Before painting, what they do? They purposefully roughen the surface. Why is that needed? Any coating we deposit either on the metallic surface or on the uh, uh, ceramic surface like uh, concrete, we want the surface to be rough, such that the addition between the uh, coating and the uh, substrate is strong. So before painting, purposefully you roughen the surface. Okay, there are many places where we need rough surface. Uh, you can think about yourself. Uh, okay, so what does this roughness depend on? Roughness depends on how the surfaces are produced and how much energy is uh, spent on producing the surface. How the surfaces are produced? Produce, surface can be produced by turning, milling, grinding, all the machining operations, or surfaces can be produced by forming operations, or surfaces can be produced by casting operations. Why glass surface is very smooth? How the glass surface is made? Glass surfaces are made by uh, casting. It is the liquid, uh, when it was in liquid, because of very high viscosity, the glass assumes a very smooth surface. The surface tension of the liquid makes any liquid surfaces very smooth. That is why when you have a mercury, mercury surface is very, very smooth. Uh, some of these uh, people where we need very smooth surfaces in olden days, when we had not managed to find out how to make surfaces very, very smooth, uh, people used mercury. For example, when you want a smooth uh, reflecting surface for your uh, telescopes, uh, people have tried to have uh, hold mercury on a very big bowl, like meters, a uh, few meters in diameter, and then slowly rotate. Rotation will give you uh, the uh, concave shape that is needed for reflecting the light. And since mercury has a, a very high surface tension, the roughness is very, very small. Uh, the surfaces, uh, liquid surfaces are typically small, except for the uh, surfaces when they are very, very large, like in a lake or like in an ocean. There, the disturbance caused by the atmospheric uh, wind will cause the surface to ripple. Otherwise, when there is no wind, we have uh, seen the Mount Kailas reflection on the lakes, the nice pictures we have seen, uh, where the reflection will be exactly uh, identical. You won't be knowing which one is the reflection, which one is the real uh, object. So that kind of smooth surface can be produced. Uh, so it, uh, roughness depends on the production of the surface. Why we can't produce metallic surfaces just like uh, uh, glass surfaces? Yes, we can't produce it because uh, atmosphere uh, oxygen will make the surfaces oxidize when the metal is melted. So uh, if you go to space or if you do the casting in a very high vacuum uh, chambers, then you'll be able to produce the surfaces of metals which are as smooth as possible, uh, like that of the uh, glass. Uh, but however, it is highly energy extensive. In order to create surfaces, you need to spend energy. Most of the time, surfaces are created by fracture process. If you know, like if you spend more energy, you can have more fracture, which means surfaces will be very, very rough. On the other hand, if you want a smooth surface, you want to keep on removing material like we do in polishing, layer by layer, every time you remove less and less material. So the amount of energy again required to make a very smooth surface is also very high. So the other way of looking at it, those you are uh, familiar with thermodynamics concept, it depends on the entropy. You need to, entropy is what? It's a, uh, a disorder. Uh, higher entropy means higher 
uh, disorder. So you want to reduce entropy. That is, you want to make the surfaces smooth. You want to make the surfaces ordered. For that, you need to remove energy from the system. How will you remove energy? Only by consuming, uh, spending energy. So you need to put in more energy in order to get in a more smooth surface. Yeah, it also obviously depends on the uh, material uh, which is, uh, of which the surface is made of. For example, if you know mica, we have all uh, used up uh, iron boxes we have opened sometime or other. It has mica with a copper coil around it. So these micas can be cleaved very, very perfectly. If you are careful, it can produce an atomically smooth surface over a large surface area. Okay, so uh, there are multiple ways of cleaving mica in such a way that you can get very smooth surfaces. That is, that that the material itself uh, makes sure the surface is smooth. Same thing happens with crystals, single crystals, uh, with certain cleavage planes. Like sodium chloride, if you form a crystal, it can be very smooth along certain planes. And uh, diamond is another example where people purposefully break the diamond along the cleaving plane to make it smooth and to polish it, okay? So Surat and uh, originally it was invented in uh, Belgium and then uh, Indians uh, became master of that, how to polish a diamond, such that it produces total internal reflection to give the shine. So all these things uh, depends on uh, reducing the surface roughness. Is roughness a natural state or it is created by human beings? No, it's uh, any surface left to itself will become rough over a period of time because the entropy of the system will always increase. The entropy, increasing entropy means increasing disorder. So disorder means more number of atoms are moving away from the ordered positions on the surface. So surface will become uh, rough over a period of time. In material science and metallurgy, especially if you have taken anybody taken material, you would have heard this term temperature induced roughening. That is to take a very, very smooth surface, mirror finished, polished, uh, nice surface, you heat it up uh, in, a, in a highly uh, non-reactive uh, environment, the surface will uh, become rough uh, because of the temperature. And the amount of uh, roughness will depend on uh, the surface was heated. So these are all the some things like it tells you like broad idea about what you mean by roughness. Okay, so whatever I'm going to talk about, uh, most of it uh, will be there in these uh, references. Uh, I think this video is getting recorded, I guess. Uh, so you can always go back and then uh, you can, uh, these are the books where uh, I have referred uh, to make this uh, presentation. Uh, obviously, most of uh, uh, my uh, research work also has gone in. But uh, some of these concepts, whichever I'm going to explain, will be found in this uh, references. Okay, so why we, uh, where we use uh, surface niche in the maximum uh, extent, uh, it is in manufacturing. In the shop floor, uh, when the components are made, we, the surface finish is an important uh, criteria. So uh, it, it becomes a part of a quality control. And then uh, that is how uh, this uh, measurement of surface roughness uh, became an important uh, thing. Otherwise, most of the time surface uh, roughness is a secondary effect. We don't care surface is rough or how smooth. Just to say, ah, it's rough, can you smoothen it better? Uh, take a emery uh, sheet and rub it off, uh, that's all. Or if it is uh, the, uh, when your uh, wall is very rough, okay, sir, I will put a little bit more uh, fine cement and the smoothen it, that's all he will do. So, or he will paint it with a uh, liquid of uh, liquid mixture of cement uh, uh, and some binding agents. Uh, you paint it like that, surface will become smooth. So, uh, typically we ignore that. But however, in a precision manufacturing, we needed to have a very well defined uh, roughness. I have already gave you the examples of uh, sealing surfaces. Any mating surfaces, the roughness becomes important if you want to make them leak proof. So uh, that is how uh, manufacturing, uh, we don't call surface roughness, we call, tend to uh, call it uh, like surface finish. There are multiple ways of uh, specifying surface finish. Uh, I will not get into the detail. Uh, so uh, broadly, we will say uh, uh, surface finish consists of three components. We say lay, waviness, and surface roughness. 
lay is the uh, everybody knows uh, like if you are uh, i will give the details in the next picture yeah so you have this uh, lay uh, is the machining mark left over on the surface due to various uh, uh, machining processes uh, so you can have lay which is uh, vertical horizontal it can be radial it can be cross hatched it can be circular or can be all the scratches can be produced isotropic randomly distributed okay can you tell me like uh, which one produces which one yeah, i have listed a list of uh, uh, machining operations on the right hand side and the different types of lay on the uh, produced on the left hand side uh, Ashok, anybody wants to answer or I will ask you to answer this? Since you are the expert of uh, 1D, 2D, 8 ground surfaces. Okay, I will give only one answer. Uh, anybody wants to take a guess? Dear participant, uh, please uh, ask question, Vishnu. Yeah. One second, sir. Vishnu want something. Vishnu, Vishnu, you uh, can speak to sir, and you can ask if you have any doubt. Okay. Uh, let us not pressurize uh, Vishnu. Uh, Vishnu. <laughs> uh, Okay, fine. So I only one thing I chose. I I would uh, ask you to do it in your uh, mind. Uh, which one is which? You would have seen all these surfaces. You would have seen uh, this uh, uh, different lay patterns that is produced. Uh, I will just point out honing produce cross hatch uh, uh, surfaces, and honing is done for uh, internal bore of IC engines because this cross hatch pattern help us in uh, soaking lubricants, retaining the uh, lubricants on the surfaces for longer period of time, that helps in lubrication uh, of uh, piston cylinder arrangement inside the IC engines. So it is a day-to-day -day, uh, mostly used one. That is why we do honing. Uh, honing was invented and found out to be uh, uh, very beneficial for IC engines to in re reducing the wear and tear. Uh, previously, if you remember all these uh, uh, cars, ambassador cars, we need a reboring of uh, engine, but nowadays the, we don't have to rebore the engines till the life of the car. We tend to change the car after 15 20 years uh, and still uh, you don't need a reboring reboring is still done for uh, the big diesel engines of uh, sometimes of the trucks which are heavily used uh, so this is the roughness can produce this lay can produce can be used for uh, our benefits also uh, this one so off late uh, 3d printing uh, uh, is becoming very famous uh, I will again leave it to uh, you guys to find out which kind of lay pattern it will produce when you do a 3D printing. Okay, and it will depend on what type of 3D printing uh, machine you are using. And it becomes very, very important in the strength of the material developed by 3D printing, uh, the lay uh, direction and the uh, pattern becomes important in deciding the strength of the material printed by the uh, 3D printers. Okay, what is waviness after that? Waviness is a very long term uh, curvature. So, so if you're going on a road, which is going up and down, you feel right, that is what is uh, waviness. Uh, roughness and waviness is uh, differentiated by uh, the wavelength. How, how, how far is the very large wavelengths uh, is known as uh, waviness, very short variation is known as uh, uh, roughness. Yeah, so waviness is encountered in day to day machining. If you have used, uh, try to do a component out of titanium alloys, uh, you will see surfaces always wavy. When you are, see your face uh, on a ever silver uh, 
that is stainless steel plates that you eat food in a new plate you will see the waviness your face won't be as smooth looking like you are seeing on a mirror uh, you will see some defects some curvatures so that is caused by waviness so waviness is i say long uh, range variation uh, in the form whereas roughness is local if the surface is rough you are not going to see your face surface has to be smooth so stainless steel uh, surface is very very smooth to the extent that uh, you can uh, light gets reflected uh, uh, specularly so that you can see your face uh, but the surface is uh, bent wavy over a long range that ensures that your face look uh, either concave convex or multiply curved yeah so uh, that is the difference between waviness and roughness uh, so we are uh, this uh, it is very important to control both the things this waviness will also become as a form error form error is you want the plate to be flat absolutely flat uh, but uh, this waviness is a deviation from the flatness and that is also going to uh, create trouble uh in assembly and other things in a precision components of course waviness for a plate uh, hardly matters right roughness also it doesn't matter if the sort of if the plates are rough then cleaning becomes difficult scrubbing becomes difficult even you boil a milk in your vehicle uh, in a uh, in your utensil the all these creams will get deposited on the side of the uh, utensils if the surface is very very smooth then it is easy to clean it will come off if it is rough uh, they tend to stick just like uh, we discussed that a little bit earlier you want a surface to be rough in order to hold the uh, uh, coating uh, adhere the coating to the substrate so if the surface is rough the coating of uh, milk cream or milk solids will be adhering to the utensils very strongly so you want a smooth surface so you don't want to create roughness while cleaning the utensils and same thing with uh, non stick pans non stick pans we want surfaces to be smooth uh, one one uh, one type of non stick pan which we are aware which we normally use is coated with ptfe uh, it comes off nicely but there is also a ceramic plate which is slightly expensive white in color if you see the surface is absolutely smooth okay it is made of ceramic surfaces which has lot of pores and the pores are filled with by uh, with some lubricant so we uh, some polymer so that polymer keeps on coming off little by little by little so whether it is good for health or not it's a different question but it makes your dosa not to stick on the pan and it is easy to cook okay so these are all the uh, uh, we will come to that if you know that we know what is roughness uh, can we think about uh, measuring the roughness there are many methods we can measure uh, there are uh, broadly classified as non contact methods and cotton methods uh, uh, non contact methods uh, involve observing the surfaces in uh, in microscopes either in optical microscope or scanning electron microscope or transmission electron microscope are using interferometry uh, to obtain a 3d profile of the surface i'll give examples a uh, contact method is uh, typically uh, mostly used in the shop floor and very easy to use and uh, very uh, gives you a quantitative number so uh, it's uh, one uh, profilometer is one of the famous uh, uh, instrument that is there almost in all the shop floors which has a quality control uh, this one so profilometer was introduced uh, first by taylor hobson uh, you know and most of the uh, earlier research in surface roughness was sponsored by uh, taylor, uh, those company uh, that company yeah and uh, off late uh, once the atomic force microscope was invented uh, it became easier to measure surface roughness at very small scales and very Uh, detail roughness uh, down to atomic scales we can measure roughness okay so what is this uh, uh, optical microscope we will see we, we can see i will give some examples of uh, scanning uh, electron microscope uh, method of using this one this uh, non contact optical interferometer uh, uses a interference pattern between the uh, uh, reference surface like a, a smooth mirror and a sample of whose roughness has to be measured the light uh, reflected out of these two surfaces interfere 
and depending on the path length they form different uh, interference pattern based on this interference uh, pattern uh, you can always uh, uh, measure the roughness back calculate the roughness so you get uh, th there are many methods you uh, put it for references those who are interested can look into it one is called phase phase shifting interferometer and the one is called vertical scanning interferometer and we can uh, use this to get a uh, 3d surface profile like this you see this is a polished mechanically polished uh, steel sample uh, this is from uh, the lab where ashok did uh, his phd and they have this instrument and they measured it and i think this was uh, taken from a presentation made in my tribology course uh, so you see that's how the surface is uh, varying uh, with this one the color represents uh, what is the z direction uh, how much variation is there it is the total size is like 1.8 by 2.4 mm uh, for that you can see the, the variation is in uh, 3 to 4 uh, micrometers 3 to 5 micrometers in the uh, vertical variation as you see that uh, the edge of the uh, sample will give you the roughness profile and this is uh, how it is said the you can see also the lay lay is this uh, direction uh, are you able to see my uh, laser pointer? Right. These are the lay, like vertically, it was polished like this in this direction. That is why you see the line and that we call it lay. And also it becomes a component of uh, roughness at some scales. Okay. So this is how a typical uh, optical profilometer will give you the roughness. And the scanning electron microscope, if you see, it directly gives you the rough. You know that uh, the bottom surface is more rough than the uh, top surface. Uh, immediately on seeing it, you can uh, detect that. The top surface is also ground, bottom surface is also ground surface of, I think, uh, steel. Uh, you can see uh, the depth of cut in the bottom thing is very high. Because of that, there is a huge uh, deformation. A uh, lot of plastic flow and the edge cracking and things like that. Whereas in the top, uh, still there are grooves formed by uh, grinding wheel grits uh, rubbing against the metallic surface they form uh, this uh, plowing marks or grooves and uh, but they are all very uh, nicely and ordered uh, okay so this this kind of things also helps but it uh, hardly gives us any uh, quantitative numbers on the surface roughness uh, sometimes what we can do is we can take a cross section of this material, then it becomes a destructive testing. You take a cross section, look at edge wise, then you can see how the uh, roughness is varying in the material. That is also we can use a scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope can only be done for the cross section samples. Okay, so this is the, some of the examples of cross section samples. This is a aluminum surface, which is fractured just like a tearing a paper you have uh, we have made a groove and then pulled the material apart and this is the fractured surface uh, which we can see the same surface when you see at a different magnification you will see different kind of uh, details you see this is uh, uh, are you able to see the whole uh, powerpoint or uh, my uh, video is uh, hiding sorry everything uh, visible sir okay wall wall well, right, PPT. Mm. Good, good. Uh, so, uh, and also, Ashok, uh, can you confirm my uh, pointer is visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as you go down uh, in the magnification, this is the scale bar is about one micron here. This is 20 micron. This is 200 micron. You can see the surface becomes smoother and smoother, is, as I was pointing out uh, in the earlier Kanjanjanga picture. As we keep on magnifying, the roughness uh, amplitude keeps on decreasing. Okay. Uh, let me come to this stylus profilometer, which is the one which is uh, normally used in the shop floor by you know, most of us. Uh, it, it consists of uh, 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 what you call a stylus. Stylus is nothing but uh, a gramophone pickup. Those who have seen a gramophone, they will keep on changing the needle. Uh, you see that that is the needle is the one which we call stylus. It has to be very sharp. Uh, initial days before this uh, profilometer was developed, gramophone records were actually used to measure surface roughness. Instead of rotating, they had this one. So this one is nothing but a glorified gramophone record moving along a straight line path rather than a, 
circular path. So you have a very sharp stylus which is coming in contact with the uh, surface and you apply a very small force like 50 milligrams. If you apply too much force, the sharp uh, needle will scratch the surface. Then you are not measuring the uh, roughness, but also you are damaging the surface. So you apply a very, very small load. Uh, if you don't apply a load, what will happen? They will never be, contact will never be established. So you need to have some load and typical load is of the order of 50 milligram. You apply a 50 milligram load, a sharp pin will come in contact with the surface and this motor unit will drive this uh, surf, uh, the stylus in a horizontal plane uh, like this. When it moves, the pin is dragged on the surface. Because of the surface roughness, the pin will move up and down because it is held with a very, very small force. So if the force is very high, it will end up scratching. As I said, it will start uh, what we call it a scratch test. So when the load is very, very small, that uh, the pin will just move up and down uh, over the rough surface, just like a gramophone record works. And this move motion of this stylus is picked up by a suitable transducer, typically a, a, a electromagnetic transducer like LVDD. So this will give a variation of height, how this pin is moving up and down as a function of the uh, distance the stylus was moved horizontally. So this is how this one, this is exactly similar to what the profile which I was showing of uh, Kanjanjanga and uh, aluminum surface. Uh, so typically this is measured. And once we get this profile, we have, uh, we can see how the profile is varying. You see, this is a turned surface profile of a, a typically turned surface. And this peaks corresponds to the pitch that we have used, uh, uh, that uh, corresponds to the feed rate of the tool with which we have fed uh, cutting the seal. We all know that uh, feed rate has to be very small if you want to create a smooth surface and depth of cut has to be small. And this is a function of depth of cut and the no, uh, shape of the cutting tool, uh, your turning tool, a nose radius especially. And uh, what is the depth of cut and the feed rate decides the roughness. You can see, and there is a, this, is, this forms the lay the peaks, periodic uh, shift forms the lay, and there is roughness in between that. On the right-hand side, you see this is a ground surface. You see here, this magnification is, this is 4 mm in a horizontal axis, whereas vertical axis, it is only uh, 40 micron. So uh, it is 1 is to 100, uh, the magnification factor between the x-axis and y-axis magnification. So if you do one, uh, one is to one magnification, the, the peaks will be very, very, very tiny. It won't be like this, it is stressed out. So it is not really so much rough uh, when we see it with the naked eye, it looks very, very smooth. Uh, this is for example, on the right-hand side is the ground surface and the same vertical magnification, uh, vertical to horizontal magnification I have plotted, uh, uh, but the scale is different. It's not uh, 40 micron. So grinding surfaces are very smooth, but grinding produces more deeper values than the peaks, whereas turning produces sharper peaks than deeper valleys. There is a difference between the turning and grounding surface. Sometimes both are, uh, uh, each one has its own advantages. And all these things does not get captured by the uh, roughness profile measurement, which we are going to discuss in a couple of slides later. Okay, if you see, uh, uh, then uh, profilometer, contact profilometer, if you see the latest entrant to the, this one is atomic force microscope. Atomic force microscope even applies even smaller uh, force to the tip of the uh, uh, probe. Uh, so uh, it doesn't damage the surface and it measures roughness in 3D and it is very fast, but the disadvantages are it will measure only a small surface area that is, in the previous one, we have measured over 4 mm, whereas uh, uh, the AFM, typically uh, the best AFM can measure only over a range of uh, 90 microns, 100 microns, that is 0.1 mm. So only, only up to here we'll be able to measure. That is, we won't be able to see these peaks. 
within this peak what is the roughness is what uh, atomic force microscope will measure but the resolution is very very high both in vertical direction and horizontal direction uh, that it can uh, measure it and it has its own advantages i will see some of the thing how that atomic force microscope i think i am running out of time i will uh, skip this uh, you can see atomic force microscope again works on the same principles as like uh, contact profilometer uh, except that it has a cantilever uh, flexible cantilever on to which the probe is mounted and so that we can vary the stiffness of the cantilever by which we can control the force that is being applied on the surface and also we use a uh, close loop uh, monitoring of this force or a deflection such that the force can be kept constant instead of varying whereas in the in the previous profilometer contact profilometer we kept the displacement constant the position of the probe with respect to the sample was kept constant and it was allowed to uh, deflect above that mean position whereas in atomic force microscope using the close loop uh, monitoring we will be able to either keep the contact force constant or we keep the uh deflection contact uh, co uh displacement constant like we did in contact profilometer so uh what is the problem with the measuring all these things if you see uh, any probe uh, cannot be infinitely sharp it has to be blunt at uh, some length scales if you are blunt uh, if you see this picture uh, if you have a small roughness element which is spherical uh, a spherical ball or spherical uh, particle sitting on the surface if you have a profilometer of this curvature it will measure a very broad uh, roughness uh, this one if you have a sharper one it will tend to go closer to the uh, uh, roughness element similarly if you have a groove on the surface uh, the groove is smaller than the tip radius of the uh, probe then the groove will not even be uh, measured for that we need a very sharp probe uh but very sharp probe will uh, do two things one it will damage the surface uh two it will become blunt as soon as you bring it in contact because very sharp surfaces means stresses are going to be very very high which means it will break uh, tips will break so typically the stylus used in contact profilometer is uh, made of diamond and the diamond also given a tip radius since it is difficult to make a, a smooth rounded hemispherical uh, surface out of a diamond uh, some of the people some of the manufacturers what they do is they use a uh, flat they just cleave the surfaces of aluminum so you will have a, a truncated pyramid as a, a surface of course we are talking about the size of the pyramid of the order of 1 micron so it is very very uh, sharp uh to the naked eye only at very high magnifications you can say this one so this lateral resolution that is the distance between two consecutive uh, roughness element that can be measured is limited by the tip radius in the uh, contact profilometer in non contact profilometer it is limited by the wavelength of the light used because uh, light cannot uh, uh wavelength of the light is, gives the resolution of any microscope we know that i will just leave it at that so this is a typical uh, uh, image of the uh, uh, afm image of the surface uh, various surface we always start with mechanically polished surface because we understand that uh, inherently uh, so you see on the left, left hand side uh, the whole scan size uh, lateral uh, this length is about 5 micron by 5 micron and the variation in the vertical direction is not the roughness is is varied as a contour plot here you can see that is between 70 micro nanometers to plus minus 70 nanometers that is 140 nanometers is the typical variation in the height when we do a chemical etching take this surface and uh, put it in chemical uh, like sodium hydroxide to etch out the roughness you will see the roughness style changes and it becomes more rough 120 to minus 120 nanometers the roughness becomes a different kind there all the sharp peaks were removed and you get a very uh, craters like surface like a moon surface a uh, lot of uh, craters on the surface and also some uh, peaks are there because material is not homogeneous uh, wherever precipitates are there they are not dissolved so they form very sharp uh, boulders like a typical uh, mountain uh, range which you see 
like a himalayan mountain ridge if you see which is uh, not granite you will have lot of mud and some rocks are sitting on top of it is similar to this and if you want to reduce the surface further uh, make the surfaces smoother what we do is we do uh, something called electro polishing electro polishing is the way uh, all this uh, your stainless steel plates were uh, produced because they do mechanical buffing but still it will have lay marks like this and so it won't give you a reflective uh, surface where you can see your face finally what they will do is they will do one electro polishing that is the deposit in a electrochemical bath and pass a current okay if by this one uh, we can get a very nice smooth uh, mirror finish surface uh, you can see this is very very uh, variation in the height is very very small so what are the limitations of afm as i was telling is typically about 100 micron it depends on the piezoelectric scanner and uh, smallest roughness features that can be measured is limited by tip radius and tip radius we can get a fresh tip can be of the order of 10 to 15 nanometers but it becomes rough if you don't know how to use the tips yeah there are some uh, background corrections and all have to be removed because of this so once we get this measurement done what do we do with that how do we quantify the roughness we know that there are multiple measures of uh, 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 parameters uh, that can be used the typical parameters is what we call ra is the arithmetic mean deviation ra is value is defined as a summation of the absolute value of the variation of height about the mean plane right it is a mean of the variation of the height of uh, uh, variation of the modulus of the height and it is easy to calculate that is why it is uh, very popular especially in uh, us and all uh, ra is the value which is very popular rbs roughness is the next one which is re represented by rq or rbs it is but the little bit complicated is stuff modulus we take square if you don't take modulus here if you take the actual value then ra will become zero right it is just a mean of this one because we have defined z that is a variation in the height uh, as a function of x uh, which is the horizontal direction in, in which the probe was moved uh, uh, has been normalized by the mean plane mean line yeah so that is why uh, that uh, ra will be zero so uh, unless you put the uh, modulus that is you take only you ignore the sign and take only the values okay rms roughness is uh, eliminating that by squaring that surface this is a least mean square uh, uh, error fitting which we do for the curve fitting this is the same uh, principle rq is defined as the mean of a uh, uh, square root mean square that's all okay there are many other parameters which are easy to calculate and has uh, been used in this one uh, rv rp rz are all uh, like tells you how many peaks and valleys are there they don't really take the whole uh, measured profile into account and then skewness and kurtosis tells us how much this height variation varies from the normal distribution normal distribution was initially started by as i pointed out uh, greenwood uh, was the guy who introduced that the roughness should be uh, random and uh, the roughness uh, profile should be uh, can be characterized using a gaussian uh, roughness profile uh, gaussian uh, gaussian probability distribution function and skewness and kurtosis uh, tells us how much it is variation in this one but later on Uh, he himself realized and he made me realize that uh, uh, this roughness is not a random process for example if you have a peak if you are sitting uh, standing on a kanjanjanja peak next point next step which you keep will not take you to the deep uh, ocean you know next step is going to be some steep fall but still it is not going to be as steep as as you think unless otherwise you are standing at the edge of a building that is man made structure can make very vertical uh, uh, roughness profile okay we can create whatever surfaces we want to create but if the naturally existing uh, rough surface cannot have such a peak, uh, sharp uh, ledge so that is where the whole purpose uh, of uh, there is a, there is a nice uh, uh, article written uh, written by professor greenwood in uh, we are channel 
I think it was one of the hundred years, uh, hundred we are uh, hundred years of we are journal, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, in that one, he had apologized the community for introducing this uh, Gaussian method of uh, characterizing surface roughness, but still, uh, that uh, way that approximation has helped us to understand surface roughness a lot. Okay. But it need not be exactly uh, accurately uh, telling the way uh, the surface roughness is developed. Okay, there are other parameters uh, which will consider, uh, which are much more uh, important in a practical viewpoint. One is called bearing uh, area curve. That is, you find out, you take a section uh, like horizontal section, and you find out how much of uh, uh, length of this line it is cut by the profile. So if you see this one, this surface here, when you cut here, amount of uh, uh, intersection is very, very small. Whereas if you take a line, amount of intersection is 100%. How this uh, area varies tells us uh, is named as bearing area curve. Why it is bearing area curve? If you have a large bearing area, uh, then the stresses are uh, reduced because the contact load is distributed over a large surface area. Whereas when you have a very low bearing area, then the surface is very, very uh, at this region. Here, if you are operating in this region, then you are likely to scratch the soft surface. So uh, how typically this is um, uh, done, in a, this is coming from a practical viewpoint. If those of you who have seen the uh, uh, process called scraping, uh, to make the surfaces flat, especially of a soft material like aluminum, magnesium, which is mated to uh, another surface, you want to make it leak proof. What the surface after machining, what they will do, they put it on a surface uh, uh, plate, uh, there is a smooth uh, flat surface, and then uh, find out which are the places where the contact is existing and remove material only locally at that point. So by uh, repeatedly scraping of the surfaces which are coming in contact, you can typically increase the amount of contact area that is, uh, uh, that is existing with the uh, mating surface. That is why most of the walls are lapped in position. You take the, the mating uh, wall surfaces, uh, both the male and female part, apply a lapping compound and do the lapping that will ensure high uh, leak proofness. Okay, so bearing area curves becomes useful in that uh, sense. There is also something called texture parameters. What we saw till now is the height parameters where it worried about the variation of height above the mean line. Uh, if you see the profile on the left-hand side and left right-hand side are very different, but from the height parameters viewpoint, it will give the same value. So to account for that, this texture parameter was introduced. Texture parameter basically tells you how this height is varied with uh, respect to the x direction. So one of these parameters is known as autocovariance function. It is defined as this one. You take this uh, height up at this point and then multiply with the height at a different uh, point uh, at the distance tau. And you keep on doing that over the whole surface area and sum it up. Uh, then you get this autocovariance uh, co function or autocorrelation function. Autocorrelation function basically tells you uh, how correlated the roughness is. That is, if you have a sinusoidal profile, the autocorrelation uh, function is going to be sinusoidal. This is well known for electrical and electronics engineers, signal uh, processing uh, thing, uh, uh, engineers. Uh, they know this uh, energetically. Uh, this uh, autocorrelation function uh, of a randomly rough surface will be exponentially uh, dropping, and the scale, uh, the, the rate at which it is dropping, will tell us uh, how. how how, uh, see, you see, this, uh, this is varying very sharp, which means the surface is varying very, very, uh, surface is rough uh, at even a smaller than scales, whereas this is varying smoothly, same variation in the height, but distributed over a long distance. So this uh, autocorrelate, this exponential decay is uh, broader. So basically, if you take a, a instead of autocorrelation function, we can also, uh, this can be z, this can be y, uh, it can be two different functions when you do that. For example, if you say uh, this can be a positive COVID number and this can be uh, like recovered patient, 
and even you do a correlation between the number of recovered cases to the number of uh, positive cases this function will give you what is the time taken for recovery in india most of the cases right now if you do this analysis it tells us about 13 to 14 days people are recovering since the time they get reported as infected yep yeah. so uh, i'm going to uh, uh, jump now Uh, if you take a fourier transform of uh, auto correlation function you get something known as power spectral density we will talk about power spectral density if you don't understand mathematics it's fine uh, those who want to know uh, more details of the mathematics you can refer to this uh, book on uh, rough surfaces or you can read uh, some of my papers right so uh, what are the issues in characterizing rough surface uh, i think i have got another 10 minutes i will stop then we will take questions um, uh, there are some measurement issues there are some lateral resolutions as we said that uh, we have to use always a sharp tool to measure in a contact profilometer or in a optical uh, microscope optical uh, profilometer uh optical resolution decided by the wavelength of the light which is about 600 nanometers will be the uh, limit of the lateral resolution atomic force microscope can give you a resolution of uh, of uh, 10 to 50 microns lateral resolution and there is also a vertical resolution vertical resolution can be very very high but the problem is uh, lateral resolution and uh, there is always a question of filtering once you get the data what you do with the data most of the times the uh, filtering is done and this filtering will decide uh, the numbers which we are getting so uh, it has been standardized for industrial applications by two things one is the resolution of the method we use uh, basically they use a band pass filter okay so uh, very large wavelengths are cut off and similarly very high uh, small wavelengths are also cut off only a uh, range between uh, say 10 micrometer of uh, wavelength and uh 100 uh 800 micron 800 uh, micron and 10 micron is the uh, standard filter which is used typically in the industrial application so this variation will also cause the change in the number so uh right atomic force microscope can have a uh, 10 nanometer resolutions or better depending on who is using and how sharp tip is being you uh, used and uh, as i pointed out uh, some time back uh, there are some problem with uh, this gaussian assumptions okay the surface roughness now we have realized that it is not gaussian it is more or less uh, it's what is known as fractal okay so we will just talk a little bit about uh, fractal uh, i will skip this tedman diagram and then come to uh, fractal surface is a fractal fractal is a new word introduced uh, as late as i think 1983 uh, before that itself uh, people inherently knew uh, this is one of the old papers of uh, archer which says surface is made of uh, spheres uh, riding over uh, on the back of a sphere which is riding over another back of the sphere sphere on the back of the sphere on the back of the spheres okay and each sphere as uh, progressively changing in uh, size if you can imagine a, a tortoise back cell that is what a typical surface was imagined uh, by archer we have a tortoise uh, which is uh, at the size of the tortoise we have a big hemisphere on top of that there are multiple smaller hemispheres sitting on the back and if you imagine still smaller hemispheres sitting on the back of that uh, smaller hemispheres and keep on doing it infinitely then the surface becomes fractal okay so uh, this is the typical example given how do we generate a fractal surface generating fractal surface is very easy uh, this coker is uh, 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 what is known as a self similar fractal that is you take a, you, you keep on doing a repeated operation you take a triangle you take a line break it into three parts we place the middle part with the uh, triangle like this so uh, one line becomes a uh, one two three four lines so and now you have four lines break each one of the line into three parts and replace it with the four parts right if you, then you will get this then uh, if you do each and every line take here 
and replace it with this uh, thing you will get here so at any point of time if i zoom this structure it will look like this right as we keep on doing this one uh, if you have a final structure uh, then it will look identical at every magnification you will not know uh, what is the magnification scale this is known as a uh, fractal okay so this uh, video is not working okay doesn't matter ah basically it shows uh, how this surface is done and uh, this is uh, uh, i will request you guys to go and read more on fractals it's a fascinating new area and it doesn't need uh, high mathematics to understand basics uh, we'll see this is what the picture i was showing if you see kanjanjanga uh, it is like this however if we zoom in here the roughness is not going to be like this it is going to become smoother and smoother this is what is shown here in the bottom picture a yeah, fractured aluminum surface which is seen at different magnification it becomes smoother and smoother and acm uh, same thing fractured aluminum surface it becomes smoother and smoother i keep on zooming in whereas the fractal curve, curve if i keep on zooming in it appeared the same so this is known as self similar fractals this is known as self affine fractals that is the variation as we keep on magnifying the vertical scale does not magnify the same amount as the horizontal scale okay the magnification the way so becomes the peaks becomes smoother and smoother flatter and flatter other way of thinking about is if you think about the angle this angle you see this angle of this peak uh sorry i lost my uh, laser pointer okay you can define uh, as per the angle as this right see this is a very sharp, steep angle this steep angle whereas here if you see angles are very very low and if you see angle is even smaller okay so this angle variation in the slope of the uh, as, uh, uh, this roughness is also keeps on decreasing uh, as we keep increasing the magnification okay and this is also here again very clear you see this is like this about uh, uh, 160 degree here it is close to 180 almost flat there is no variation in the height okay this is what uh, i am showing this same uh, picture uh, as we keep on increasing magnification the roughness uh, variation becomes smoother and smoother and if you measure ra value this is a sigma square sigma is rms value rms value as a function of some sort of forget about frequency uh, some sort of uh, uh, sampling length if you can say or uh, zoom length magnification then it keeps on decreasing uh, roughness so roughness decreases with the sampling length so it is not a inherent uh, material independent of measurement methods so one has to be careful uh, most of the time roughness quoted in the literature or in the uh, industry gives you only one number but that may not be sufficient it has to be told roughness uh, of ra 0.06 measured over a distance of 1 mm 10 mm 50 50 mm that has to be specified uh, this uh, uh, length scale over which the roughness is measured is uh, not always measured but within a shop floor within an industry within uh, aircraft industry for example they have a standard i think uh, uh, aircraft industry uses a standard of 50 mm 50 uh, over which roughness is measured so that everybody talks the same language same language okay so uh, this is what was a uh, contribution of thomas uh, uh, dear uh, thomas whose book i was referring to uh, so he found out that by measuring roughness over from uh, roughness of the moon to the surface smoothest possible surface if we plots the wavelength the power spectra function this one it's it varies like this it follows a power law that is the asperity height height of this sphere if you see if it is a fractal this height way as a function of the radius or the width right it varies as a power law as the wavelength becomes smaller and smaller 
the height also becomes smaller and smaller. This is the broad uh, gist of this power spectra. And does that power spectra, uh, how does it, how do you get that? Uh, you don't have to worry about this. So this shows the power spectra of various surfaces. This is the uh, this is a roughness of a grinding wheel. Uh, this is a roughness of a surface produced by this, this grinding wheel on EN24, that is a steel surface. And this is the middle one is the uh, same grinding wheel, same depth of cut, but roughness produced on an aluminum uh, surface. You can see that uh, it is uh, here it is frequency. In the previous curve, it was wavelength. Uh, this is wavelength. Wavelength is nothing but one by frequency. Okay, that is why the curve looks ultra, but otherwise uh, it is the same thing. So if you see, there is something called cutoff length. This is decided by the uh, manufacturing process beyond which there is no variation like this. Otherwise, the surface roughness produced because all these surfaces are produced by fracture process. The fracture is inherent, uh, which gives us this variation of how this amplitude, uh, square of the amplitude varies with the uh, frequency or the wavelength. One by wavelength is the frequency as I mentioned. And this is for various uh, turned surface. The fractal dimension, which I did not talk about it, is decided by the slope of this line. Okay. And these are the AFM uh, images. You start with the polished surface and we keep on doing uh, electro polishing, how the surface changes is what we have studied. And uh, this is how the surface changes. Initially it becomes rough and then it becomes very, very, very smooth. This is done on the same scale with electro polishing. And this is uh, schematically showing how uh, electro polishing uh, removes. What it shows from our study is the electro polishing removes uh, surface wavelengths, which are very, very small, whereas mechanical polishing removes surface uh, roughness whose wavelengths are large, are decided by the uh, grid size of the grinding wheel or the emery paper, which you are using. If you use finer grid size, it removes finer, uh, smaller wavelengths, roughness up to a smaller wavelength. Whereas electro polishing removes roughness uh, corresponding to very small wavelengths. That is basically mechanical polishing, mechanical machining removes roughness at this uh, uh, lower frequency or higher wavelength. Whereas electro polishing removes this uh, uh, higher uh, frequency and lower wavelength roughness. So by combining these two, we'll be able to uh, produce very smooth surface. Okay, uh, I will stop here and then uh, take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's a very good presentation on surface roughness and fundamentals. So we are expecting some questions from the participants. There are a few questions posted on Q&A, sir. Bob okay. sir, can you see that or shall I convey, sir? Uh, I have seen uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan Pradeep Kumar. Yes, sir. Thanks for inspiring lecture. I am involved in designing blood pumps as a cardiac surgeon. Sure. Uh, my philosophy is texture scale for surface piece of device like VAD and TAH should be in the range of plasma proteins rather than uh, blood cells. Uh, would you agree with this? Uh, can I extend this philosophy to design artificial human walls? Certainly, sir. Yes, we can discuss more about that. Obviously, uh, the roughness has to be... Uh, I don't understand what is VAD and TAH. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, if you have uh, very rough surfaces on this one, uh, all these uh, 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 living cells tend to uh, get uh, attached to this rough surface and then they cause uh, other problems. And also uh, we don't want to destroy, uh, this is one of the uh, actually uh, uh, very interesting uh, area of research that is going on. What should be the uh, even roughness, uh, we are talking about even waviness. What should be the waviness to prevent the damage to the individual blood cells, right? And uh, yes, we will talk about more uh, on one-to-one -one basis. Uh, plasma proteins, I don't know what is the size of the plasma proteins. Yes, uh, typically these surfaces which, is, which uh, we use in this uh, hard pump, uh, hard valves and all, they are very, very smooth. 
the surface roughness uh, is of the order of uh, uh, 0 0.1, 0.01 uh, micrometers. Uh, so roughness should not be a problem uh, typically because we make we ensure the surfaces to be smooth, but yes, we have to explore it uh, further. Uh, how do you, uh, next question is also from Professor uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. How do you measure finish on complex, highly curved surfaces? Uh, yes, it is, uh, 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 it's a very difficult uh, thing to measure, uh, but what there are uh, many uh, specialized instruments that is possible to build. If you know what is the curved surfaces look like. For example, measuring roughness of a gear surface, uh, is one of the thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan may not understand uh, the gear surface. It's a curved surface. So what the profilometer will do is basically it will instead of moving along a straight line, it will move along a well-defined uh, uh, path, which is uh, mimicking the uh, curved surface. If you know the geometry, so it, you just measure variation in the geometry, or you take the roughness. Uh, as it comes, as it measures. And then if you know the geometry, uh, then uh, you subtract the geometry uh, from the uh, measured profile uh, uh, to get only the roughness. That also can be uh, measured. Uh, Ashok Raj wants to answer this question. Ashok, carry on, you are high. Tell me, sir. It is written that you, oh, you want me to answer this question, okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you use non-contact 3D profilometer? Yes, I will use whatever I, is, uh, I have access to. Yes, uh, it has uh, certain advantages and certain uh, disadvantages as you pointed out. I always use atomic force microscopy uh, in my lab to measure roughness, but I, because I am interested in uh, very small lens scales, uh, at a larger lens scales in uh, uh, such a professor science scalars uh, lab, they use optical 3D profilometer. And we also have uh, large scale uh, contact profilometers. So depending on the applications and the need, uh, we will choose this uh, measuring instruments. Okay, sir. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Lakshman, I have answered your questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, clear explanation about the questions posed by Dr. Radhakrishnan. And I would like to also thank uh, we, our active participant, Professor Radhakrishnan, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And hope we yep. don't have any more questions on the Q&A. Uh, now it's time to express my heartfelt grat gratitude to Professor M.S. Babji for his uh, very good presentation on the topic, today's topic, surface roughness and fundamentals. Hope this definitely would help a lot for all participants and the fresh researchers and the researchers working on these areas would uh, like boost this, this presentation would boost them and enhancing their uh, uh, like research uh, uh, skills and all and uh, choosing various uh, methodologies have been explained by Professor MS Babji. Uh, thank you very much, sir, Professor Babji, sir. And once thank again, you. I wish to extend my uh, heartfelt gratitudes on behalf of Geetam University and management. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to connect to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Ashok. For your wonderful uh, presentation. So I was I enjoyed your presentation. So thank you very much once okay. again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank. You. Okay. So I will log out. Yeah. You can. You guys can continue. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.